Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Illumine our way this morning as we seek to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to not just know what he knows, but to do what he does. We ask this in his name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, which can be found on page 1011 in the Pew Bible. The Sheep and the Goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you that are, who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes, and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these, one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Those also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray once again. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. (laughs) 
So as I mentioned, in our liturgical or in our church calendar, uh, there are seasons, and we are just about to come up on one of the biggest ones, uh, Advent, as we prepare for celebrating Christmas. And the last Sunday in the year before Advent is Christ the King. Now, this is no mistake because actually the beginning of the church year begins with the first Sunday in Advent. So for the church, this is actually the end of the year. And the beginning of the year starts next Sunday. So as uh, early Christians were beginning to understand and think about worship and seasons and times, you think it would be very important what happens at the end and what happens at the beginning. You don't need me to convince you of what's happening at the beginning and the importance of that, because after all, if we didn't have Advent and Christmas, there would be no Easter and we wouldn't be here this morning. But what happens at the end is Christ the King Sunday. Now think about this from a God's eye perspective, a God's version, vision perspective. God is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he sent his son to be the Prince of Peace and rule in our hearts and in our minds. And yet he tells us his kingdom is not of this world. And when we look at the kingdoms of this world, they seem hell-bent on everything that is anti-Jesus. If he is the prince of peace, the kingdoms of this world are not. So actually, this makes Christ the King Sunday one of the most important Sundays for us. To proclaim that Jesus Christ is King of us, of our hearts, and of our minds, and of this church. But what exactly does it mean to claim Jesus as your king. Let me tell you a tale of two kingdoms. I visited these two kingdoms when I was in seminary, and they're not actually kingdoms, they're churches, but after all, when you look at a church, it is an awful lot like a kingdom. (laughs) And if Christ is our king, they should be, right? We visited two large, big churches in Chicago, and they were as different as different can be. They were at polar opposite ends of the spectrum, and our teachers did this on purpose because they wanted us to see two very different approaches to church. One uh, was in the uh, suburbs, and it was a, an extremely big church with tens of thousands of people. And every Sunday, they had a band with a laser light show and all kinds of singing and clapping uh, for at least 30 minutes, and then there was an hour-long message after that. Can you believe that? An hour-long message. But people were drawn out of the city and out of the suburbs, away from their problems, away from the world, and into this auditorium for Jesus Christ. And the vision and the purpose of this particular church was about helping people who are seeking God to move from being seekers to Finders, ones who have found, or rather been found, by God. That is the purpose. It is very much a 
private but also corporate, but very much a private spiritual thing. In some ways we might say, get yourself right with God kind of thing. Very much a spiritual event. And this church in the suburbs of Chicago is extremely popular and extremely effective at what they do. And then another church we visited in downtown Chicago. This was a big old uh, congregation and church. And in fact, it was one of those that had the huge Gothic uh, cathedral looking thing. And the uh, pulpit was actually so far up that it hung off the wall. And the preacher kind of stepped out from uh, some stairs that they came behind to get up. And it was very much high church. And in fact, their ushers, uh, at least when we were going there, uh, when we visited, their ushers still wore tuxedos and helped people to their seats. It was a very high church experience. And yet this church, we sat with one of the associate pastors, and he described their mission and their purpose as as one of making a difference in the community. They were not out in the suburbs, they were in the inner city. And their mission was to do something for the homeless, to do something for the poor, to really make a difference in people's lives. And I was shocked as a seminary student sitting there with my classmates and friends to hear the associate pastor actually admit we don't spend that much time on spiritual matters. We don't really have prayer groups here. There's not a whole lot of Bible study Our concern is for the least of these. Now, I was sitting there, and I won't name any names because actually those big churches are quite famous, and my sermons get recorded, and who knows who's going to hear my sermon. (laughs) But I'll stand here in the safety of this sanctuary, and say that both of those kingdoms have got it wrong. And they've got it right. They're both extremes. They're both polar opposites. One where it's all about the individual and your personal salvation and your personal walk with Jesus. Forget the world. It's all about getting into heaven. And then on the other side, the other kingdom is, we've got to do something and make a difference in this world. Prayer and Bible, that'll take care of itself. Now, I don't mean to stand here and pass judgment on them as much as I mean to lift them up as two different kingdoms and two very different views of what it means to be the church. And I want to, this morning, disagree and agree with both of those. Isn't that nice? You can have your cake and eat it too. (laughs) They're both doing something right. It is about our spiritual life. It is about prayer and study and gathering together within the body and growing in our faith. But it's also about what we do for our neighbors and the world around us and the least of these. It's both. So Jesus tells a parable a story about a king, a king who comes and separates his herd, a sheep from a goat, and separates them, one at his right hand and the other at his left. And he says to the one at his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom 
the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Now on one side, a very popular version, a popular expectation is, oh good, it's that time. It's the time when I get to say and remind God that I believe. I've said all the right words. I've said all the right prayers. I've done all the right things. But did you notice that the sheep themselves were surprised? They were surprised because the king wasn't there to praise them for saying the right things. The king was there to praise them for doing the right things. And the right things were caring for the hungry and feeding them for giving drink to the thirsty, for visiting those who are sick and imprisoned, and for welcoming the stranger. And they're surprised to find out that this is why they are inheriting a kingdom. And the goats are surprised that they are going to Listen carefully. They are going to eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That is where they are going because they did not care for the least of these. Let us not fall off in one direction and totally focus on one. I bring up these two kingdoms on purpose because this text is actually used to support the change the world and better people's lives kingdom at the expense of personal prayer and a life lived with God. It's both. But Jesus makes it very clear that what we do for others and what we do not do for others makes a difference. So let me ask, who are the least of these in your life? They're probably not obvious people. They're ones that you might be thinking of who are in your heart and on your mind. We lifted up a bunch of them this morning in prayer. These are people that are easy to reach out to. But I'm talking about the people that we pass in downtown Eugene. The people that we see walking our own road in front of the church here on Oregon Avenue. Those carrying everything that they own on their back. You know, I have a unique opportunity uh, being a pastor to be the receiver of uh, these folk who are coming and looking for help. Part of it is because I park my vehicle right out by my door and they know that that means somebody's here. And they come knock on the door and they tell me their story. And believe you me, I have heard a lot of stories. And I am sure, I am absolutely sure that one or two of the stories that I've heard is true. Most of them, I'm not so sure about. But you know what? Here at this church, I would say 95%, maybe more, of the people who ask get help. Regardless of what I think the validity of their story is, 
Let me tell you about one couple who drove up the other day. They pulled up right in front of the office as I was getting out and coming in, and they had California plates on their, uh, on their car, and the car was loaded down. It was obvious that everything they owned were, was in that car. And they were stuck here in Cresswell with an eighth of a tank of gas, and they needed to get to family because they were at their rock bottom and they had nothing else. And you provided them gas through the love fund. You provided them gas to get where they needed to go. Let me tell you another story about a woman who was really struggling and uh, just like this other family, she had all kinds of problems, too many of them for me to name. And it took quite a bit of time just to figure out exactly what it was that we could kind of help with because the problems were so great. And it turned out that a tire Actually, two tires needed to be replaced on her car, but one of them was at its end. We can do that. We went to the tire factory, we got it replaced, and she was on her way. Believe you me, she's got a whole lot more trouble, but that was one thing that we could do. And I've shared this on more than one occasion, and I struggle with this because one of my seminary professors told me as a pastor, as you're preparing to go out and serve God's people, and that means all of them, he said, remember that Jesus Christ saved the world so you don't have to. And I struggle with that because it's true, but then on the other side, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Folks, the need out there is great. If you don't believe me, watch the news. We just saw 15 individuals in our own community displaced by a fire. One of them, an 11-day-old baby. The need is great. And one day the shepherd will separate the sheep from the goats. Let's not be surprised where we end up. Amen.